Jilly is going to record this for any one of us who has missed it and she's going to add it to her YouTube channel because I know there were a few people. You wouldn't think people are so busy during lockdown, but a few people are like, no, I'm already on another call. <laughs> can't yeah. um, so now what I have to try and do is share the screen. I've not got a share screen option. No, you should do, my love. Go right to the bottom where it yeah. says um, it yeah, should say that. share. Is it not giving you that option? Um, bum, bum, bum. It is. It's giving me. It's giving me this one, but you won't be able to see my face as well. Let me see. No, you. We will see your face as well. Oh, okay. We should do. Yeah, we, we should do. Yes, here we go. Look great. Fantastic. Yay! Brilliant. I'm very excited. Oh, amazing. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a little bit of an intro of you, Julie. Uh, oh, too. Thank you, lovely ladies, for joining us. I think there might be a few more that we hop on to, but as we said, luckily, Jilly is going to save this to her um, YouTube for us if anyone wants to rewatch it. Can everyone check their on mute? I think most people are. You can just double check that you're on mute. So I first heard of Jilly a few years ago in the UK. My friend Claire had gone to a, I think you did like a one day course at the end of a conference or something. And my friend Claire had been to it and she was telling, telling me afterwards about everything you'd spoken about. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is my kind of lady. Just so holistic. Um, just looking at everything from every different angle. And then any of you have ever given a patient a wand, a easy magic wand or a thera wand to use at home, and um, your patient's gone and Googled it, chances are they have watched Jilly's video on how to do it. And I was just looking now, you've got 185,000 views on that one video. I think lots of people in this world who have used wands are doing it on your beautiful clock face instructional video in that one. Yes, it is a cam face <laughs> video, as we said. There's a backstory I was at some point. But there, there is a second video to that as well called It's Not About the Wand, which is obviously... Um, yes, and that one does pop up when you go Google it's not about the one too. So we have also done some research with ones, guys. I can hear there's something. Let me see. Is there anyone else who we can see? Okay, there we go. That's sounding quieter. So then at the end of last year, I went across to the UK and I did Jilly's amazing course, which is her Happy Bladder course. And I think you, when you um, started the course, you said to us, I actually miss sell this course. I talk about that. It's about, you know, bladder pain, but actually it's about chronic pain. And that's really what it is. I think I learned more about how to absolutely understand the elements of pain in that course. So yes, while your focus is around bladder pain syndrome, everything that you do and everything that you teach is really just a very holistic approach to treating the pelvic floor in general. Um, Jilly's course is, oh, it was the best course taught ever. And some of you that are on this course who came to my Poo Detectives course, I uh, said from the get-go, I have stolen how Jilly taught her course because it was not step by PowerPoint. It was standing up. It was writing down your aha moments. And honestly, Jilly, yours was like probably the best course I've ever been to. So Aww. thank you so much for coming to chat to us this evening. Jilly has also launched an online version of her course, which is on special still till the end of this month. Three days, yeah. Three days. Three days. Okay, so she's got a special for her online launch. We are definitely going to get you to South Africa at some point in the next few years to do a real lab course. But until then, your online one is available. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, you can begin your presentation. Is there anything else you want to add to your intro? Oh, Jilly's in Cardiff in the UK. And she was working NHS and private and now then only in private. And now you're just on your own. You're not in the private practice anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I just have my own clinic. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lulu, for organising this. Um, I, it is one of the joys of um, the world that we live in now that we can all connect internationally. And it is my life's mission to um, empower physios to feel a bit more confident um, about the ways that you treat patients in pelvic pain and kind of giving you the empowerment to, to treat and heal as you feel that you have to, or feel that you, what comes naturally to you. So as always, um, when I start talking, 
um, I always uh, start by saying I'm not looking for replicants of me. I am a physio. I am a physio. I am learning every day. I learn from everyone. I've learned loads from Ruby. Um, and what I am about to tell you is my approach and my um, interpretation of the evidence. Um, it's based on, uh, I did my master's and my research in 2014, um, and that developed my way of thinking about pelvic pain, but we are going to talk specifically about bladder pain syndrome tonight. So if you, um, uh, if you come away from this thinking that isn't really how I practice, but there's a few nuggets, great. You know, if we were all the same, we, it would be very boring and we wouldn't get people better. I trust that you're all fantastic physios that are getting people better already. Um, and these are just some more ideas about how um, you can give yourself permission to work a bit more holistically because there is good evidence for it. So Lulu, can I ask you um, if there are any questions that people have got during the session, pop it in the chat bar. And if Lulu, you can keep an eye on that and just unmute and ask the questions, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, it's my computer. Without further ado, we're going to talk about the what, what BPS is, who gets it, how we diagnose it, how we think about it, and why physio is useful. So it's a brief, really, really quick, quick and dirty look through bladder pain syndrome and physio for it. Starting off with the what. Is anyone, if you raise, if I put a screen shot here, oh, I can't see, you can see what I can see. Let me see how many people, there's not many people with videos. Anyone of the three people with a video treating bladder pain regularly? Most of the time when I ask this question, um, people go, oh, I might get one or two questions, uh, one or two patients a year. I don't really get that, that many patients through with bladder pain syndrome. I'm not referred them. They might be referred with interstitial cystitis. But what I'm about to tell you is that this is pretty much any of your pelvic pain patients that have a urological element to it. So bladder pain syndrome can be diagnosed as, I'm just gonna make you even smaller so you can all see. Hi Lulu. Um, diagnosed as pelvic pain that lasts for more than six weeks or months. Now that's a bit of a ridiculous statement, but that's because at the moment the international guidance were really, really developing it. And so we don't know um, how we're gonna specify it. And there's a disparity between kind of the American and European diagnoses. So we're saying it's six weeks or six months, they have to have had pelvic pain anywhere, front, back, underneath, inside, anywhere. It gets worse, this pain, when the bladder fills and it eases with bladder emptying. It gives you a persistent urge or there is an increased urinary frequency. And remember, frequency is a um, subjective statement. A lot of us wanna say, well, if you're going more than eight times, that you're going, you're frequent. But actually, if someone normally goes four times a day and going six times a day, maybe frequency for them. And with or without identified um, bladder or urethral infection. So those first three, I can count, the first three um, points are the important one. And the fourth one isn't really because we, we're unclear about the role of infection in this condition. It is a heterogeneous spectrum disorder, which means that people experience it in lots and lots of different ways. But if you have a little think now, about your caseload that you may have been video chatting with, or I'm very excited, I can see that SA um, South Africa, you are opening up and you're starting to see patients live again. So if you think back this week, somebody you may have interacted with that you has pelvic pain, if they have any urological um, part of that, then you're treating bladder pain syndrome. This is visceral pain syndrome with a bladder element. That's all the guidance. Okay. This is a very quick run through the patho summary. It, as I said, it's a quick and dirty rundown. Um, there is a lot more to it, and I do tend to go into a great deal of detail about each individual point. So don't worry. Um, there is more online about it as well. If you want to go to my YouTube, you'll find lots more on each individual point. So we know with BPS that there is a initial insult. And commonly that is an infection or a recurrent infection. We know that it takes three bouts of thrush to sensitize the system. So if someone has had thrush three times in a year, that's enough to kick off a chronic response to a um, perceived threat. But that insult could also be um, uh, an RTA. They could have had a traffic act injury. It could be post-operative, so endometrial surgery. Um, I had a lady that had a hysterectomy and that was her traumatizing incident. There was nothing wrong with the hysterectomy. It's just that it, um, uh, it heightened and her system had a massive response to it and the catheter being in situ. And then we have the other end of the spectrum where we have um, this, the assaults unfortunately that we commonly come across in pelvic health, which would be around 
um, any kind of abuse, rape, um, things, things like that, that you really have to be open and aware to about because about 30% um, of chronic pelvic pain sufferers will have had some form of um, sexual abuse or some kind of sexual misconduct in their, in their past. We need to get comfortable about asking these questions um, and about knowing what we need to do with these people afterwards. How do, we, how do we help them? Once we've had this insult of any type, there is this chronic central sensitization threat response. So the body does what it's good at. And what I say to my patients is, your body is doing a brilliant job of keeping you safe from what it considers to be a threat. Now, the problem is that that threat has passed. We've got better, but we are still responding to that threat um, in a centralized manner. That creates inflammatory neurological and endocrine changes. So we get a change in the inflammatory system. We get much uh, a greater proliferation of inflammation. We have changes in our neurological function locally and centrally. So the nerves around the bladder and the, um, the pelvis and the pelvic floor get, get altered, as do the structures in the brain. And we have an endocrine response, so kind of a hormone and emotional management becomes altered. Oh, I don't know why that's coming in responses separately. Um, we also potentially think that there's an underlying autoimmune disorder. So it could be that um, people with bladder pain syndrome have uh, a primer within their system that means that they're more likely to get this kind of issue. There's a role for nerve growth factor, which is exactly does what it says on the tin. It grows nerves. Um, it's a chemical released in different areas of the body um, all over the place. But we know in overactive bladder, um, and in bladder pain syndrome that we have this proliferation of NGF and we're not really sure why but it definitely sensitizes the bladder lining and we also have a, a change in the bladder lining so the bladder lining itself is called the glycaminoglycan layer um, and you've got to think of it as little frilly little things here and each one of these frilly little things not like the lie in your guts for little things, they grab onto a water molecule, each one of them, which gives them a really soft padded buffer to the urine. And these get broken down and you get little cracks and things appear in that GAG layer. Uh, it becomes deficient, which means that urine can get through the lining of the bladder and stimulate the C fibers, which are kind of afferents to the, the body. Remember, nerves F off from the brain and they aff towards. So that afferents come up towards the brain from the bladder and tend to be C fibers. Um, and the receptors are stimulated by the urine, urine becomes toxic, and that gives them that nagging, burning, horrible sensation. The lower part of our bladder, the trigone, has the greatest proliferation of these um, receptors, and also tends to, we, we tend to see more issues with breakdown sometimes. So we get this chronic breakdown, and that tends to be due to a chronic inflammatory um, problem. We also get an upregulation of those C-fiber afferents, which makes sense. If you're saying something repeatedly over and over and over again, you're gonna get better at saying it. So the threshold at which they fire, remember when one nerve's coming in, we have to have enough acetylcholine or other um, nerve transductor to create enough chemical to make this nerve fire. But what happens is that that threshold gets lower. So it doesn't take so much information for those nerves to fire and say something about the bladder. What that's interpreted as is up to our brain and up to our body, but um, there is this heightenedness of the nerves in the bladder and the pelvic floor. There may, in a small group, be a role for persistent resistant infection or embedded infections, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we also get a pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So, um, we have now really lovely evidence showing that the pelvic floor muscles of people with chronic pain and specifically the visceral pain, so endometriosis, bladder pain syndrome, and um, what else am I thinking of? Adenomyosis, those kind of um, visceral pelvic pain syndromes. We have this pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, if you take your hand and you squeeze it really tight, I want you to look at the color of your hand. And while you are um, squeezing that tight, you'll see it goes white and we lose blood flow. The pelvic floor becomes chronically tightened and that is partially as a response to threat in the area, but it's also a centrally driven issue. And as that tension remains, blood flow within the muscle changes, the actual structure of the muscle changes, it becomes tighter, we get 
alterations in its baseline um, formulation and, and kind of how what kind of collagen's there and how tight it is. If you kept that fist really, really tight, if you then start to gently open it, it should be a little bit uncomfortable and painful as the blood flow starts to return. Now, if the pelvic floor is like that for a long period of time, we have alteration in blood flow, which causes more venous edema. So you get a boggy pelvic floor. It's got lots and lots of fluid within it. It's poor, poorly drained, so that fluid can't get back into the system. And the nerves are massively heightened. And we actually get an autonomic neuropathy of our pelvic floor. And you were treating this all the time and you didn't know, eh? Isn't this great? So it's bit like a ball of wool but lots of different wool and what I normally say and I can't find a picture is that it's a bit like lots of jigsaw puzzles together and you're trying to fit them all together and trying to work out what to do um, and that's why we call it a spectrum disorder because each one of those um, uh, pathological uh, underly underpinning issues can be different so we're dealing with the same kind of symptoms. Someone will have urgency, frequency um, and pain in their bladder, but there could be a vastly different reason why they're presenting to you. So I like to think about it in a, in a generalized way. Let me see if I can, oh, I can still see myself, that's good. Um, so here is our lovely dancer and he has got, that's why I was moving it over, peripheral changes. So changes at the level of the bladder. And this is what I say to my patients, stuff happens down there. Your bladder lining gets um, uh, really sensitive. It's not very good at repelling urine. It's a bit like cracked skin, yeah, like dry skin. Um, but also everything becomes super sensitive. You also get a tense pelvic floor that's trying to protect everything. And then all of the information, all of the neurons, nerves around um, the pelvis become supercharged um, coming up towards the spinal cord. But we also get central changes. So those central changes are around our perception of um, what is happening at the bladder and our response to that. And I think I've got a couple of slides further on about what that means. So we've got to answer this first question about what is interstitial cystitis, because that's the big elephant in the room. Um, and I'm, I'm still not happy with our international consensus on what we think this is. I see it was a term coined in the 1800s um, when people would present with these symptoms and they would feel like they have a urine infection, but there was no evidence that they had an infection. And what they said is that there must be a cystitis of the interstitium, and the interstitium is the, the bladder lining. And that's why they call it interstitial cystitis, this perpetual infection. Now the problem is that everything I've told you so far shows you that it's not just about the bladder, and it's much more beautiful and complex than just being about the bladder. So I see is a misnomer. It's a wrong word. It leads us down a wrong alley and it leads patients to believe that they need lots of antibiotics repeatedly to get treated, which some of them do, but a very small percentage in my experience. And words are so important. The words we use with patients, the way that we explain things to patients can empower them or it can push them down. And what we really need to be about in physio, in my, um, in my opinion, is about giving patients empowerment to understand their condition and move forwards. The minute that you say that you have interstitial cystitis, it comes with really negative connotations. So the international um, understanding, she says, is that, I'm gonna have to keep moving this around. Um, can you see that? The term BPS is increasingly recommended with IC being reserved for those who have Hunter's ulcers lesions. So bladder pain syndrome is this uh, overarching um, diagnosis, which as a physio, you can diagnose yourself. We have the scope of practice, certainly within the UK, and I would see no reason why not in the essay, but you might want to legally check that with Lulu. Um, this is what they're talking about. So Lulu, just give me a thumbs up. Can you see that moving? Yeah, good, okay. So this is a Hannah's ulcer. Um, is someone uh, having a cystoscopy? They've put a scope in, they've blown it up um, full of saline, and there's someone else pushing from the outside. And you can see this is a breakage in the, a breakdown in the gag layer but quite a focalized um, break, breakdown. It's really like a, um, an ulcer that you'd have in the mouth or something else, or anywhere else, the gut. Uh, you can see this one's pulsatile, which is pretty nasty. They've got quite a lot of blood leaking. Now, there is a slight risk, a slight increased risk, that if you've had Hannah's ulcers, that it may at some point progress to bladder cancer. So patients with Hannah's ulcers need to have regular cystoscopies about every three years, just to check. Um, the problem with diagnosing people 
with these symptoms as having interstitial cystitis if they've also got Hunter's ulcers is that we have lovely asymptomatic data on Hunter's ulcers. So we know that they don't cause pain in all people. There are many people around the world that are surviving very well, probably in this group watching, who have had or will have a Hunter's ulcer in their bladder and no problems. But it's really important that all blood loss or any kind of hematuria, so um, pink, rust coloured, um, even just slightly, slightly changed darkening of urine is checked. Um, for these ulcers and for other issues like bladder cancer. Okay, so uh, that's a, a very quick run through what it is. Um, and hopefully you're already kind of thinking, right, this is a bit more complex than I thought it was. It's not just an infection. The good news is that most of that is reversible. The only bit that we haven't, and I don't, I don't tell patients this, the only bit that's not reversible is um, an upregulation in, in our spinal cord and kind of dorsal horn sprouting of nerves, which is causing some of this hypersensitivity and visceral overflow. Um, the good news is that we can have that sprouting and that upregulation at the spinal cord level, and we can inhibit it cortically. So even if this exists, I know patient, and I know it will exist in my patients that have had pain for 20 years, um, we can inhibit it cortically by dampening that with cognitive processes, as we can with anything else in pain. So vastly, it's all reversible. So who gets it? These people get it. You get it if you're in your childbearing ages, um, between the age of 20 and 60, and if you're a woman, isn't that a bit rubbish? But also, um, there is some link to uh, Jewish nation, Hasidic women, um, specifically, which shows that there may be a little genetic element, which is interesting. You also get it more if you're a woman than a man, quite a lot, uh, 10 to 1 times. And the, you can see there the data on population is pretty rubbish. <laughs> and that's because we're really poor at de defining it, this, this um movement towards understanding that bladder pain syndrome is a uh, spectrum disorder and it's something that we need to um, look into a bit more has only really begun in the last 15 years we're bad at deciding who has it and defining it well uh, and this one just shows a pie chart that anywhere between 0.3 and 30 percent of the population depending on which um, criteria you use have it if you translate that into the uk population that is up to 2.6 million women and up to over half a million men I don't know the population um, density of South Africa, but this is huge. So this really is when, when I say it's about your patients that have got pelvic pain, male and female, mostly female, with any kind of urological component. If we look a bit more specifically about who gets it, we know these people get it. So if you have any of these non-bladder syndromes, and we'll look at it a bit more closely, chronic pelvic pain, depression, migraine or allergy, any of these underlying sim symptoms, you are more likely to get bladder pain syndrome. So it's a, a, a case where any of those on that list, but these are the, the biggest ones. If you have three, you are very likely to get bladder pain syndrome. And if we look here at work that's done by Clemens, but also by um, Chilimsky, that was at World Congress in 2017 in New York, New York, Washington, um, you can see that patients commonly present with kind of depression, PTSD, psychometric issues, psychological um, issues, mental health issues, progress to migraine or more physiological issues, and then down towards ICBPS. And we call it internationally in the research community IC slash BPS because we're moving away from IC towards a BPS definition. And what that does is that captures everyone that hasn't caught up yet. Um, so call it BPS bladder pain syndrome, biopsychosocial, um, not IC, but in the literature you'll see it as ICBPS. So that little statement there about people might get it if they've got underlying issues, allergies, sicker, things like um, migraine, they're all underlying autonomic challenges. So when we think about this potential um, trigger underlying all patients that there may be, it might exist genetically that some people are more likely to get that. And we know empirically that some patients have more um, purinergic receptors at the level of the bladder, so they are more likely to get overactive bladder. So it would make some sense that there is an overarching um, autonomic underlying issue. As part of that, you can see the end of the list was things like th chronic threat states such as fibromyalgia, which we know to be a chronic threat state. There is no one single cause of it. It, it tends to be a buildup of lots of things. And the idea that there may be an underlying autonomic concern there is really interesting. Okay, so we're going to talk about how it's diagnosed. Um, 
it's going through a maze. I like my I like my images to make my points for me. Um, yeah, it's really hard. On average, it's about seven years for a diagnosis, and you'll know this from your patients. It's about the complexity, and that complexity causes a misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, and delayed diagnosis, which is the challenge in understanding who gets it, and then trying to work out how to treat them better. We know that it's a diagnosis of exclusion, so you have to exclude bladder cancer, um, infection, uh, other musculoskeletal issues, low back problems, pudendal nerve issues, which kind of maybe don't exist, lots of other things um, before you actually arrive at a diagnosis of BPS. But on the way, you're going to be called vulvodynia, um, pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, levator ani syndrome, overactive bladder, um, urgency frequency syndrome, piriformis syndrome. You know, th these are those patients that come through that are does referred to you with vulvodynia but have urgency that gets worse when their vulval pain is bad. Now the patients with prolapse symptoms that um, when, they're, when they have a, a wee they void it feels better but it's also not so painful and then it goes back to being really um, symptomatic. So you know this is a wide wide amount of patients. When Chang et al looked back at patients that had been diagnosed in a um, specialist gynae clinic they found if they applied the criteria pain anywhere in the pelvis gets worse when you need the toilet, gets better when you go to the toilet, increased urgency and frequency. They found about 70% were wrongly diagnosed. And then when they applied that data to 140,000 American households who had um, some uh, symptoms, they found that of the 40,000 people with symptoms, 50% had no diagnosis whatsoever. And of the 50% that were diagnosed, again, about 70% were misdiagnosed. So we're just not getting it right. This is the stuff that a doctor should do as far as the UK is concerned um, and Canada and the European guidance I looked at, but they should do lots of things. They should talk to the patient. They should have a look at their bladder. They should do a cystoscopy. Um, and it's really important that all your patients, if they're coming to you privately, that you write to the doctors or the urologists that you work with to make sure that that patient is being caught because this is, uh, it has exactly the same symptoms as bladder cancers. Um, and they can exist in the young population. So it's really important they get a full medical workup and that you're working alongside a medical um, doctor. Uh, they might do flow metry, they might do lots of other things. I have certain opinions about some of these tests being less useful than other ones, which you can catch me for a chat about at another time. We're gonna talk about embedded infections really quickly. So this is a Mr. Malone Lee picture that he let me use. Um, and you can see here the purple cells are the bladder wall cells and this isn't a very happy bladder this is a bladder that's got some infection in it so the the green i can't point the green cells are bacteria the red cells are blood cells that have been released into the urine now in that bladder you would have antibiotics if you've got an infection you take the antibiotics that would go around your body end up in your bloodstream come out into the urine go into the urine so the antibiotics would float around in the yellow and they would kill all the green that are in the yellow but if that bacteria has migrated into the top layer of the cells and then it's migrated downwards as it has bred into three or four or five or six layers downwards in the cells, those layers down there are going to be protected from the antibiotics at the surface of the bladder. Now, what the bladder does when it's infected and has an interstitial infection is it proliferates, it thickens because that it, it gives it more of a buffer to where it thinks the, the threat is. It makes sense. And what it does then is it sheds the top cells. And when it sheds those cells, you get cloudy urine um, and a sudden burst of bacteria in the bladder. And um, that can cause a flare of symptoms. But the problem with antibiotics, they say, is that if we take them for three days, but actually that infection has been there for more than maybe a week. Um, and it's been rumbling along. It hasn't really been caught. It hasn't really been treated. It may have borrowed its way down and proliferated. So actually you need to treat the um, person with um, antibiotics as long um, long enough for them to for the cells at the top to be shed and cells to move up one shells cells shed cells move up one until they all from the base layer get to the top get in contact with the antibiotics and there's nothing below them that has also continued to get um, bacteria within it so that is the problem with an embedded infection so Malone Lee's team who's now retired but his son's working is quite a lot in the UK there's a lot of contentious issues around him. He got struck off at one point, wasn't allowed to prescribe, because what he says is that 
patients should be on very high dose, very broad spectrum antibiotics for a long period of time, which can be dangerous. However, their safety data is really good. Um, they haven't had many incidents. Um, they've published some fantastic findings and the patients fought for him to be reinstated because it changed their lives so much. Now, the, the thing about an infection is that I took his, um, his, his concepts and, and the data around it and they've got a lovely paper, the Shibi Swami paper here, which you can read 10 years of their data and it's really cool. Um, I took that information to Washington a couple of years ago and said to all the researchers, you know, the world's best bladder pain researchers are there. What do you think should I be taking? How much weight should I put behind this? And they all said, yeah, this is a thing, but look at all the other stuff. <laughs> we've got the changes in the brain. We've got the changes in the tissues. We've got this, that, and this. And it doesn't necessarily mean that an embedded infection is causing the symptoms. It may be one of the tissue drivers. And so it may be something that you do need to look at and you need to be talking to your consultants about. Um, but I certainly have a, quite a good picture in my mind now, having moved on from that, that I only worry about embedded infections in patients who have weird flares. You can't explain them any other way. There aren't any other threats to the system. There aren't any other bears. Their, their body thinks that they are fighting. Um, and they're just really weird flares. So be aware of embedded infections, but also know that about 30% of the people we're all walking around with um, embedded MRSA in our nose and we haven't got a chronic outbreak of nose pain. So why is physio good? Because of this, I'll let you read it. Because if you just treat the bladder, not much happens. And that should make sense. Um, on the course, I like to go into a lot more pain science, not as a treatment, but as a, an understanding baseline for all of us. But the, one of the key caveats of pain science is that um, you don't have to have no susception to have pain. You just have to have a, um, a perception of threat. And a tissue driver may be there from the tissues. It may be that a chronic inflammation, not because of an infection, because an infection that happened a long time ago or a trauma that happened a long time ago, creates this inflammation that breaks down the lining of the bladder and then it keeps perpetuating because it's broken down its source so it keeps inflaming and um, that might be happening but if you treat the bladder and you put some lovely chapstick or um, lipstick on dry lips into the bladder you give it some installations or other things and um, which doctors like to do it doesn't take away the autonomic neuropathy in the pelvic floor the pelvic floor dysfunction or the brain driven issues so if we don't treat everything else we don't get anywhere and this is empirical data from Hoffman that showed limiting treatment to the bladder is ineffective. Um, there was a point of this. There we go. Physiotherapy is recommended for patients with pelvic floor dysfunction, phenotype directed, which is which box are they in? How are we going to best treat them? And we don't really know what those phenotypes are, but it should be multimodal management and includes lo lots of stress management and psychotherapy. And that isn't because we think that they're stressed and they need to cope better. It's because psychotherapy and stress management are brain physio ways of cutting the problems that occur, the, the, the development of maladaptive processes that occur in the brain. It's about rewiring that to allow them to experience less pain. So it's, it's really about brain physio. And this is my favorite statement to back up any of you guys that are looking for reasons why you should be treating these patients for how long and how you should be funded is we know that we need to work for at least three to six months. Um, many of my patients, I'm lucky because I'm in private practice, will see me for eight months to a year. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, long-term treatment is useful. Okay, so in treatment, we want to look at the peripheral and we want to look at the central. And I'm going to quickly go through the central, uh, the peripheral first. First thing to think about is the fact that we know there is this concept of visceral overflow. So nerves within the, let's think about it, where's the bladder? Within the bladder are shared with the suprapubic region and the perineum. I think you probably could have told me that, but these are the areas in which they, they are somatically and viscerally referred. In the uterus, we might also feel it in the lower back or the urethra, and I would add low legs or, or top of thighs to that as well. It's certainly where I feel my, um, uh, where cramps occur and things like that. So we have this both localized peripherally, a, a sharing of nerves, but also centrally a perceptual sharing of where we think things go on. And that's because our visceral proprioception is pretty naff. And I don't know if naff is a word you have in South Africa, but it means rubbish. Um, because we've never seen it. We don't see our insights. 
And here's another lovely statement from an, an interesting article by Peters that without effectively treating the pelvic floor, the bladder symptoms remain. And I'll let you think about that one again. So without treating the pelvic floor, the bladder symptoms remain. So then we think about how can we treat the pelvic floor? The myofascial release is what I, I'm choosing at the moment to call it. I'm, I'm moving towards something else, but I'm yet to find a, a terminology that describes the process of putting a finger onto someone's pelvic floor and releasing the tension or feeling a palpable change in tension um, at the same time having an impact on their pain and doing it in such a gentle way that you don't cause issues. Now, the thing to say about why treating the pelvic floor doesn't change, uh, without treating the pelvic floor, it doesn't change um, the bladder symptoms is twofold. And I know we're talking peripherally, but the first off, being specific, one of the sections of, of brainy anatomy that is changed, is maladapted um, over six months of having persistent bladder pain is an area of the brain that's responsible for how urgent your bladder feels, how full it is, how much attention you pay to it, and also how tense your pelvic floor is. And these three parts are very, very closely linked together. Now, we can't really effectively massage the bladder because A, is a visceral muscle. It's right deep inside. It's not very comfortable. And B, we know that it's more about the set kind of um, upregulation in the sensory information and processing in the bladder. But we can touch the pelvic floor. And because these, this area is shared, if we, and it's heightened, if we use the pelvic floor to reduce that heightening, we get a concurrent reduction in these symptoms. And this is what I'm going to show you. So this was my data from my research in 2014. And it showed we treated everyone um, with weekly pelvic floor intervention, individualized for them, and found the first six weeks in the yellow group, um, a, which I think is still about there, um, a good reduction in their symptoms. And it was an, an average of about 40 to 50%. I think it was about 42% it came out as. And the yellow group also used a therapeutic wand at home, not because I think wands are the thing. I tend to, in 99% of patients, they use their thumbs, they use their fingers, they just do breathing exercises. But because um, I was doing a trial to show the NHS that it was safe so that I could prescribe wands if I wanted to. Um, the green used uh, breathing techniques in between seeing physio but they still came to physio once a week so in six weeks we can see that we have effectively treated their symptoms now this is six weeks of us putting our hands on and doing myofascial release contract relax stretch contract relax stretch five o'clock and seven o'clock if 12 o'clock is clitoris six o'clock is back passage so in those back corners into the biggest area of muscle i don't tend to go elsewhere because you don't need to um, you don't need to press on the bits that hurt, press on the bits that don't hurt. It's much nicer for the patient and then go find the bits that hurt before and you'll find they don't hurt anymore most of the time. Because um, it, it's not necessarily about what's happening in that section of the muscle, it's about what the brain thinks is happening and also about changing the localised blood flow. In that contract relax sub threat, so we're going to not be a bear, we're not going to be bears to our patient, we're not going to ramp up that um, response. So you don't want to be pressing so hard that you're causing um, more inflammation and a more of a, a uh, nocebo, not a nocebo, yeah, a nocebo response, um, increasing it. Six weeks of doing that, just as a physio or a physio using patient using a wand at home is effective. Great. Then I left them alone for six weeks and let them carry on. The green guys kept doing their breathing techniques, didn't get worse. Woohoo, great. So for those patients that you've had um, a good improvement on and you leave them alone because your clinic is overrun when lockdown opens and you think, oh, I'm never going to be able to see you next week because you're, you're full. Well, know that if you've done a good amount of work and they keep doing their breathing exercises or stretches or whatever you want to give them that works for their pelvic floor, they will stay OK. But the people that continue to do work for themselves and continue to use their thumbs or a wand to work with their pelvic floor, will keep getting better. And that is not because we are changing the tension in the pelvic floor. It's because we are desensitizing centrally and we are desensitizing locally. And that is a key concept because the more you tell your patients that having a tight pelvic floor is a painful pelvic floor, A, it's not the truth, and B, it means they're always gonna have to come back to you when they've got a tight pelvic floor and they're not gonna be able to manage it themselves. The reality is that a tight pelvic floor is not a painful pelvic floor. We're all physios, we go on courses, we feel each other's pelvic floors. Is that happening in South Africa, Lulu? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so on a course, 80% of physios are, Whoa! you know, pelvic fills around their eyeballs or they've just had a baby and it's not so good. And that's why they're in pelvic health. Um, I weight train. I have a tight pelvic floor that's around my eyeballs somewhere most of the time. Not painful. No dyspareunia. Um, a painful pelvic floor that is uh, currently feeling under threat will be painful. Okay. So we are relaxing and releasing our pelvic floors, but we're not doing it to make them relaxed. We're doing it to desensitize the system that there are no bears there. You, know, you are having a conversation with their nervous system and you do it in a, a beautiful holistic way, which you all know how to do. You don't, you know, you don't go straight in and assess someone. You have a talk with them and you put your hands on them and you, you coax their nervous system into allowing you to keep calming it down. Okay, so it's all about the D word. That's what we're about. It's not about trigger points. Um, I'm not going to talk about them. Just I will put up a link or Lulu, you can link these people to a couple or seven videos that I've done about trigger points and my thoughts on them. Then we've got to think about the centralized stuff, um, which is the holistic stuff that you are already doing, but it's got evidence. So we've got to think about the motor changes that happen in the brain. And we've got to think about the sensory processing changes that happen, which is really hard to think about when you're, um, uh, when it's visceral sensation because it's different to proprioception when we've got joints that move we know where they are but if we've got viscera and it's a bit somatic we don't really know um there's a couple of us me carolyn van dyke and um, judith thompson and ben wand who wrote the Fremantle um back pain smudging questionnaire about um somatoperceptory dysfunctions and distortions we're currently rebrand we're redoing the Fremantle and trying to make it into the free pack um to measure some of these sensory changes so that you can just go into clinic and tick it all off and then go, oh, I do need to look at that, which is in most patients. Um, but nonetheless, it's cool. So that's going on with Australia at the moment. Uh, that word is a word I can't see. So let's move this. Limbic, ah, of course, how could I forget the limbic? With six, uh, six weeks to six months, who knows? Probably, I think this one's a six month there. Um, of your brain spending so much time looking down at your bladder, I've got two minutes, looking down at your bladder going, there's bears there, there's bears, and wanting to know about what's going down in the bladder, it doesn't have enough energy to keep looking for the other bears. Because that's the job of the brain, it's to keep you alive, it's to keep you functioning. So after six months or six weeks of processing this information, it shifts responsibility to your limbic system. If anyone knows what the limbic system is, you're doing well. It's the area that processes emotion. So now your emotions become intrinsically linked with your pain. Your partner is horrible to you. Your emotions heighten. That drags your pain into a worsened state. You have a bad day. You eat some tomatoes that trigger you. Not all patients are triggered by tomatoes, but your symptoms get worse. That really, really depreciates your mood. You become very depressed, suicidal. And they come hand in hand. And you know this because these are the patients that sit in front of you and they are helpless and hopeless. So one of the first things that we do as physios, I think very naturally, is a process of limbic disengagement. Yeah, desensitization, pulling apart those two areas. Can we support them limbically? Can we build them up? Can we talk to them? Can we give them CBT um, if they uh, need a bit more sp specific structure? Can we support their emotional needs in any way? Yoga, mindfulness, relaxation, lots of stuff that will allow them to be distanced from their pain because then you can observe pain and not have suffering. Suffering is something separate. Suffering is the limbically driven bit. Pain is the experiential bit. And in, um, uh, in working with chronic pain syndromes and certainly viscerally driven pain syndrome, visceral pain syndromes, we need to be looking to disengage this first. That's where Lula gave me my favorite review ever um, of the course where she said, my woo has evidence. My woo-woo has evidence. It was great. Um, but it is. We, we know that if we can change the function of the limbic system and make it not responsible for pain state anymore by calming the whole system, that actually we get changes in um, bladder inflammation. Okay, so that emotional driven stuff has an effect on the peripheries and how much inflammation there is when they've taken um, biopsies of people's bladders in different emotional states. Amazing. Don't put anything else in there. And then all the autonomic stuff. So how they're responding to threat. Are they flushing? Um, are they sweating? Are they having feeling sick? Are they feeling disgust? 
um, when they just look at a, an image of a vulva or a penis or, or anything else. Um, these autonomic tells that they are fighting bears, that they're in a really heightened state, we can, we can change that. So we really have to be thinking and not just giving um, lip service to the biopsychosocial. And we often think about them separately as in this image. So Claire has bladder pain syndrome. She's got no friends and um, psychologically she is catastrophizing. So we kind of say this is her problem and this is why she has this problem and we blame her for it. When actually we need to be thinking a little bit more holistically. Um, Claire has bladder pain syndrome. Her social circle is very limited and actually we know environment and social, uh, social environment and interaction has a direct impact on the embodied experience of pain. Um, and if you go and watch Mick Thacker's um, uh, TED talk on predictive processing, go and watch some of that kind of stuff. There's a really lovely girl called Laura Rathbone Van Meurs um, who talks a lot about stuff that I don't understand but is really clever to do with pain. But we know that that social element has a real effect on pain and it will have a real effect on the inflammation at the level of the bladder and the heightenedness of their nerves. So that, that, pay, that, that structural bladder issue is also part of the social issue, which is also part of the psychological issue to doing with the catastrophization because that's her limbically driven response to this. And it's all one. So actually, if we change the limbically driven response, we might find that this starts to peter down. Um, and that's why we have to be much more holistic and it's evidence. So Carolyn Van Dyken does a fantastic course um, online, live online for four or five weeks uh, called something like the biopsychosocial something. Um, look her up. She's great. It's called Reframe Rehab is the uh, new kind of online teaching company. They're doing courses all the time. Um, it's not expensive. She makes it very uh, achievable, especially in times of COVID. Um, but it gives you a structure and a lot of people get worried about this psychosocial that you know you feel comfortable to ask them a little bit but you're not too comfortable to to kind of jump in there and start doing cbt because it's not within our scope standard what the course does is it gives you a structure which um i'm only chatting about because i did it and i thought it was amazing and it changed my whole practice it gives you things to do um this is the approach i feel that we should be following which is from van dyken and um hilton so it was sandy and um carolyn a couple of years ago about using a proper biopsychosocial assessment followed by desensitization of everything centrally and peripherally looking at graded motor imagery and graded exposure which we haven't talked about a lot but i'm going to show you what i do um, and supported self in, uh, independence and self-efficacy of, of where we get to we often jump through these too quickly and that's why we don't make progress so graded motor imagery is about getting your brain to fire the areas that are representative of the viscera that we're wanting to treat um, in a way that lights those areas up, but doesn't light them up so much that you get a, um, an awareness of that area enough to create your automated threat response. So if your bladder has been threatened for a long period of time, um, and we get these patients where they can't even think about a toilet or going to the toilet because they get pain and it is real It's not in their head. It gets worse within their body if they think about pain Then we need to start desensitizing their brain to be able to think about it And then we move on to thinking about doing stuff with it now in CRPS of the hand and the foot We're really good at that and um, we've been doing it for a long time But with viscera and with other stuff, we're not so good at that and this is the one part of what I've told you today that is uh, being completely made up in the best way that kind of clinical um, uh, that we're at the forefront of research and understanding and this is where I'm doing a lot of work at the moment in trying to understand how we can apply GMI concepts to the viscera if we can um, and everything else is heavily evidenced this is kind of it's what we're having a go at but I like sharing and I like to hear from you so if you're doing stuff let me know so if we start off with um, getting people to be able to look at images without having a triggered response. Sorry, I'm going for six minutes over. Um, so these are images of my physio team. Jenny, we, we good for time. You can carry I, on. We, our meeting's not after, so you just carry on. We Okay, I we should are. only be five minutes-ish. No, no, we good. So um, in, in the way that you can con all physio teams into getting naked for you at any time, because we're physios, um, I, conned my, I asked my team if they would take some vanilla images, which mean really basic, simple pictures of the pelvis in different positions. And what we do is we ask people to judge if that's the left or the right side of the pelvis. Um, now, that 
judgment call, we know that the brain has to do a bit of gymnastics. So if, if you look at this image here, it should be very quickly clear to everyone that this is the left hip because we look at hips all day long. We look at people all day long. But for your brain to do that, it's had to imagine you in that position, put your body and rotate it into that position and then decide whether that's correct or not or whether there is an error. Um, and it does that very quickly. And we know it does it less quickly if you have an issue with the processing of that area and with your proprioceptive awareness of that area. We know that true to be in hands and we think it's probably true for everywhere. But you see how I'm using the outside of the pelvis, not the inside as a kind of a way in to look at this area. So this would be getting them to look at different areas and go, which side is that? Which side is this? Which side is that? Then we progress to doing it on more complex images, which, yeah. So hopefully you could um, you could hear that. I don't know why it's gone a bit quiet, but we're looking at the speed at which people um, uh, respond, whether they can proprioceptively to be aware, if they can do that dance in their head, but also is there a bias towards one side or the other? We haven't looked at it clinically. There's, there's a couple of us in all over the place, Canada and American here, that are trying to put something together looking at it. Um, I, I don't think we're yet in a position where we could do that because we don't know what's going on. We don't know what we think is happening but certainly in, in clinic what I do is I do this as a quick test with people looking at dancing images just to see if there is an obvious problem if there is a big lag on one side they're really rubbish at finding their right side um, they never get that right and there is an issue on their left side of their pelvis or an issue on the right side if there's an obvious big lag then this is something we'd work on getting them to look at images in in magazines or around them that kind of thing let me see if I can turn this up what is up Oh no, this is the same one, sorry. Um, so that's uh, people, so the lady in front of you here that you can see um, is fine, she doesn't have an issue, and one of the other people does. Um, we move on to looking at more complex images of um, the, uh, the kind of the internals of the bladder. Now I made a choice not to put anatomy images on screen. I think for patients that have got issues with that affronting image. It's not socially something we would look at anyway. It's got real pornographic connotations. Um, so I don't think that's quite right. So I always use ca cartoons. Um, but my friend Katie Kelly is looking at this a bit more at the moment with Volvodynia. So in this video, they are looking at finding all the different areas. What I'm judging is how quickly can they find it? Everything's labeled, so it's really easy. Where are they choosing to find? Because they can choose not to find wherever they don't want to find. Um, is there a pattern? So uh, I don't think these videos have got them, but people with anal pain um, may not choose to find the anus or anywhere towards the back, and they might be fine with the bladder. Now in that last one, I want you to pay attention to that. She's got quite a, um, a quick and easy view of, of looking at um, the perineum. And she was really quick with it. What I do when I've done this testing is then I stop and I say, right, keep facing the, um, the screen. And that's because I'm filming them for their autonomic nervous system. So I film it so that I can have a look at their blood flow, a look at their breathing, the way they're speaking, the sound, all those kind of autonomic tells that they're having a threat response that would tell me I need to do more of the software, the centralized issues, than the hardware. There's always a mixture of two. Um, and with this chappy here, um, we've got a guy responding and then we've got a girl responding. And I'm hoping the sound works. I have turned everything up. But I need to listen to their differing responses to what they've just seen. How are you feeling after looking at the pictures? Looking at it, it just felt really congested. Okay, did you hear that, Lulu? No, not really. Okay, no, I couldn't really, but you could see it. Yeah, okay. Um, 
so with the first chappy he had quite a um an easy response to it it was very uh, yeah i'm fine um it was just a task like we'd be reading the newspaper as the second girl who in the testing had been quite good as i said how you know can you think about how you're feeling on your body what how do you feel having done that she broke down and went oh i'm feeling really emotional and actually went into a full-on panic attack and i had to kind of step her out of the room have a cup of tea calm her down and it's a really nice example of that limbically driven area so even looking at pictures of the area of her that hurts and that has been attacked and um, that's what her brain considers as a major issue there has made her really emotional and that is legitimate and it's real and it's true and it's something that we need to treat and without treating that we're not going to get very far with her vaginal pain you know this um, most people are paying attention to it that we need to to work with um, the, the person in front of us, not just their parts, their people, not parts, but we have good evidence to show us that actually these um, the brainy changes mean that that's why this is happening. I, if someone is sat in front of me that's had pain for nine years and isn't emotional, I'm much more confused. Yeah, we should have those kind of um, emotional responses. So then we might do some graded exposure, which is... Um, looking at different sitting positions so this is one of my friends demonstrating varying her posture on differingly hard surfaces and she had a great time and eventually ending up on a harder chair looking at progressing over time exposure to different things like sitting there sitting on a toilet being in a certain space but the the world is your oyster as far as you go with graded exposure and where you do and how you do this is an active patient so, So again, back to the concept that a tight pelvic floor is not a painful pelvic floor. A painful pelvic floor is a painful pelvic floor. Um, with that patient, her graded exposure was um, from an anti-gravity treadmill, blows up like a balloon, takes the pressure off your legs. She was walking at 20% of her body weight, like she's on the moon, all the way up to cycling. Why would we avoid sitting on that area? We sit on it all the time. I'm sitting on it right now. Um, and then working up to box jumps because uh, we need to look at load and impact in that area because we want the pelvic floor to learn and relearn how to take that impact. So don't, um, don't limit yourself. We've had lovely research from Laurie Fauna in the last year showing um, a, good, a good strong suggestion that actually the people um, um, that do higher level lifting have the, have the least, have the fewest, there's a word there, can't think of the word, um, have the, the smallest um, amount of issues with prolapse. Yeah, the higher that you train lifting 60 kilograms or more, um, the fewer, there we go, there's a the word, um, the fewer prolapse symptoms. Um, and that is based on, a, I think it was a survey of 4,000 women. So if um, you want to know more, my YouTube page has, I don't think this does anything, yeah it does. So loads of information for patients, um, also chats uh, about graded motor imagery, my researchy stuff. Um, other interesting clinicians and researchers I chat to them regularly and um, all freely available for patients there is a since then I've put on a whole all about bladder pain syndrome um, playlist for patients which answers more questions and if you really want to learn some more um, about this this is all a very brief version of a very long course <laughs> which I've just put online um, which is the one that Lulu did but uh, it's the lecture version instead of the active running around um, version which is freely available um, and is on sale for another three days uh, and this is how you get hold of me as I said if you're playing around and you're interested in how do we do stuff with patients or you'll see videos I've put up where I've worked with what we call cognitive flexibility and sensory processing so we get them smelling something and then going to the toilet and having a different experience or um, using uh, binaural beats which is a way of giving yourself white noise but a different levels so that the brain gets confused and it has to spend a lot of time working out the difference between the sounds very good for focus um, that can change people's pain if you're if you're interested and you're doing stuff I'd love to hear from you but yeah that's me any questions amazing Jilly thank you so so much Jilly would you mind just explaining again because since I did your course the way that I've been doing the pelvic floor release I've like completely changed. I used to have my finger in like 
releasing like everywhere it felt like other than up towards urethra. And since I've been doing those two spots that you've said, I cannot believe how much easier it is mm. and what a difference I'm seeing. So just explaining again, just those two spots you go to and how you get us to do the hold, release, and then with the stretch down. Rub my pelvis. Perfect. So, um, I think the difference is how you think about what you're doing. So if you believe that there are trigger points or tight spots within muscles that um, pressure and resistance creates a change in, then it makes sense to do it everywhere. And it makes sense to go to the areas that hurt. Um, but I would, with great respect, say that we've moved on quite a lot in the research and our understanding of A, pain and B, muscular function and tension um and you know trigger points go go watch the trigger point um they're short videos they're 10 minutes or so and i'm not ranting that much i promise um but we know that we've moved on so what we're doing when we are doing myofascial release for a pelvic floor which is up and over the hill as opposed to a lovely down and under is communicating with the nervous system to get it to calm down and be more relaxed to lengthen a muscle you have to add sarcomeres okay so we are not lengthening a muscle um, because we can't add more proteins and create sarcomeres so what we are doing is we are creating a neuromuscular relaxation in the tissues and we know again there's good strong evidence that a neuromuscular relaxation doesn't occur as a response to threat so if you go too hard and too painful you're actually going to increase that proliferation of inflammation and um, tension at the muscle so if you think about your pelvic floor mine's a bit whoop, there we go you can see it um, the blue bits are also coccygeous I don't know why they make them separate but if you think about it most of the attachments happen around the coccyx and they come anteriorly our patients will have lots of pain around um, 11 to 1 o'clock so I um, I don't know how you guys teach it in the UK we're taught to do two clock faces kind of horizontal and vertical he never made sense to me. So I just do one kind of round bowl shaped clock um, where 12, 12 o'clock is their clitoris, six o'clock is their back passage. So if I am using my finger going into their right hand side at the back, that is their five o'clock, that is five o'clock. Okay, it's not my clock, it's their clock. So this is five o'clock and that is um, uh, seven o'clock. Because all of the muscle has the greatest attachment here, it's also, um, it also doesn't take so much strain. When you start having a look at other areas of the muscle, you find that they're thinner, they have, um, uh, they have a greater amount, look at the neuroanatomy, they have a greater amount of nerve endings that are um, more likely to be pressured by what you're doing. It also saves you a lot of effort if you just go for the back. So what I do mm. is I come over to five o'clock and I sit there very slowly, very gently. I get them to contract, I get them to relax, and then I add some pressure. I get them to contract, I get them to relax and I add some pressure. And it may just be that you get that, a tiny amount, but as long as you've got a muscular action, we get a bit of presynaptic inhibition and a better muscle lengthening. And then we do the chat. What would you do with 178 million pounds if you won the lottery? How's your cat? Oh, did your sister get that dress? You know, the hairdresser chat that puts their system at rest. And if they're really struggling and they're looking under threat, then don't go there. You know, we shouldn't be forcing them to do anything. But if they're okay, work on reading their system while you're there on, on creating calm and safety in them. Yeah, you are not a bear. Uh, being very slow, very still. If it hurts, stop, be less, be less pressured. But repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it in a gentle way until they're feeling happier and that they've got a bit more length. If you get them to breathe into their abdomen, you get um, a bit more lengthening in that pelvic floor because of the intradominal pressure. Um, by breathing a big belly, we get a bit more release and you will feel it go down a little bit further. So I do five o'clock and seven o'clock after I've assessed all the way around. And then I'll come back and I'll have a feel anteriorly and generally it will have reduced. Mm -hmm. My other golden rule is, is you stay away from the bit that hurts. So if you go in and um, you're coming over to kind of seven or eight o'clock or sideways and that really hurts, then don't go there. Come and treat the opposite side 
contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. Because what you're really doing is talking to the nervous system and a little bit getting a, a change in the blood flow of that muscle. Um, treat the nice big belly of muscle that you can have here and then come back over and see, and you should have a point, three point, two point, you should have a significant change um, in pain. And often it'll be, someone will say, oh, it's an eight out of 10. You come back and it'll be a four out of 10. Great, four out of 10, is that? Is that okay for you? Can you tolerate this? Is this comfortable? Great. Well, then let's do some contract, relax, contract, relax on this side now. Um, but it, I, I don't know about you, Lulu, but I find I it saves time because I'm not. Oh, Julie, it's been an absolute game changer. Since I learned that from you, it's the only way I do it. And it is, it's so much quicker and you just get far better, yeah, far better compliance and results. I can't believe I was not doing the contract and then let go before. I always say to them, I'm like, you are not a Kegel girl, but the only time you're going to Kegel is while you're here with me. This is the only lifting you do, okay? Or if you're doing your own releases at home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It works in all forms. Like we know back in the day at uni, we were taught PNF stretching, and it's exactly that. Um, it's that, you know, PNF hamstring stretching, working a muscle is a much more effective way of getting it to relax. Um, but being that, I'm, I'm very biased towards neurocentric treatments, but I think I do believe that what we're doing is much more about the nervous system and not so much about the tissues. We're also affecting the tissues. Um, so you need the nervous system consent to do what you want to do to the tissues. And the way that you get that is by, act, by including it. Any other questions? Is everyone asleep? Sorry. They've all gone to sleep. Nothing on the chat? Let's have a look on the chat. No, just some just some thank yous. Are there lots of thank yous? Any other questions, ladies? That was great, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. The other thing that I've learned from Jilly that I say to everyone, except obviously being in South Africa, I say it's a lion, not a bear is our bodies know two states. We are either running from the lion or not running from the lion. And you need to think about what lions have been in the room today. What have I been running from? And often they'll be like, oh my goodness, I realize what my lions are. And I think when you bring it down to the absolute basic, is it this or is it that? Are you running or are you not? It's just like, oh, okay, I understand now. Yeah. Where it's all going. And yeah, they're, they're chronically wound up. So we don't have shades of gray. Unfortunately, every bill that comes through the door, every person that cuts us up when we're driving, every um, time our child shouts at us and we think, we love you, but why are you such a shit? Um, we are wound up and we're having a, a threat response running from that line. And then throw COVID on top of it. Yeah. And then, I mean, I've had ladies back in the last two weeks that I haven't seen for eight months, that I haven't seen for 10 months. Everyone's just like, it's all just got too much. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm finding it goes two ways. So either there's a the group of patients that are ang predominantly anxiety driven in a, a, a general mental health state point of view that are having a really horrible time and that their pain is horrendous. And then there's the patients that have environmentally driven anxiety and depression yeah. or environmental issues with work, with the physicality of having to interact with other humans and things like that. They're all brilliant. It's like so many, I, my caseload is 90% bladder pain syndrome and a couple of prolapses. And um, they're all so much better just from being at home, having a better access to a toilet, no anxiety about it, being able to drink more fluid, eat what they want. Um, and I found all my pains improved in the beginning. It was almost like there was a bit of a novelty about our lockdown. I mean, I was just hectic, okay? We couldn't even leave the house or anything. And I found everyone improved in the beginning. Yeah. And now even... Even the ones who like don't even have like the typical tri triggers or stresses you would think. I had a lady this morning, she said, Lulu, and I mean, they, she's like, we have all the money in the world. I have a beautiful family. I have everything. I mean, they've just refurbed for South Africans to own like a house in Mayfair is like ridiculous. They've right. just refurbed their whole London apartment, like everything. She said, I just can't. I'm in so much pain. I'm so constipated. What is wrong with me? I just hate myself for feeling like this. It's like just suddenly everything, even she said, Usually exercise is my life, my friends are my life, we can't leave the house, we can't do anything. And I was and she said, and I just feel so bad to complain because I've got everything. Mm. Yeah. It's really tough and it's it's a um it's a broad spectrum anxiety driver. 
and mm -hmm. all we can do is mitigate for it and some people aren't going to be able to have those those skills to mitigate it doesn't mean we blame them for it it just means that they can't physically mitigate their own anxiety percent, you know levels um, and hopefully we get a uh, some kind of resolution and some kind of um, vaccine at some point well, I was reading that they reckon that by the time the vaccine comes, it'll be too late. It'll be gone. It's going to have done this and then it's going to be, there'll be no more. Yeah. Impressive. Oh, who knows? Crazy, crazy times. But I read last week that one in four South Africans now has no money and no food. Oh. One in four. Yeah. Sure. It's horrendous. It's yeah. the same. Like, you know, um, all of this is important, but at this moment in time, there are there are greater things that we need to be managing, um, and bladder pain, you know, helping patients to just survive at this moment in time um, is important. So that when we're back, and also survive ourselves, to be the most in tuned and empathetic, um, in the in a proper way, not just sympathetic but empathetic um, therapist, we need to be making sure that we're all doing okay. So cut yeah. yourself some slack. I had a sleep in today. I've reduced my um, my clinic hours so that I don't I'm not back to back constantly just so that I can cope with it um, and I'm allowing myself days off which would never happen <laughs> so you know whatever you need to do is keep yourself going you know our patients rely on us um, for so much and it is very draining so really look after yourself, guys and do whatever you need to do to to stay healthy definitely well I can't see more than three or four in a day Otherwise, that's lines in the room for me. Then I'm overwhelmed. Then I'm <laughs> too many lines. Let's see if I start that again. Too many. Yeah. Lovely ladies. Would anyone else like to say anything or have a chat? If anyone's on Instagram, make sure you follow Jilly as well. So YouTube and Instagram. Are you Jilly Bond or Jilly Bond Physio on Instagram? I must check. Uh, Jilly Bond Physio. Jilly Bond Physio on Instagram. Yeah, it's only um, Twitter that I'm Jilly underscore Bond. Everywhere else is Jilly Bond Physio. Okay, super. And ladies, I will pop you an email also tomorrow with all the links to the things that um, Jilly mentioned. And thank you so much again for joining us, Jilly. You are amazing. And we will get you here in real life at some point in the next five years. I'd, I'd love to. I hear that the wine is uh, very good. And also, I want to see the monkeys. I've heard, I've seen. Oh my monkeys. soul. You don't want to see the monkeys in my house. You can have the monkeys at my house. I'm sorry over them. Oh, oh, I love them. Honestly, I've got pigeons and seagulls. You can have, I'll have the monkeys. You have the seagulls. Yeah, I'll take the seagulls. I'm done. I'm done with monkeys. <laughs> Actually, today there were so many little babies, and even my kids are like, but mommy, those ones are quite cute. So I was like, yeah, okay, those babies are quite cute, but they're trying to come in the door, so close the door. <laughs> <laughs> they turn into big ones as well. Exactly, exactly, and they drive you crazy. Oh, thank you so much, Jilly. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.